our struggles for justice and truth, to comfort one another without hatred or bitterness, and to work together with mutual forbearance and respect through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Again, good morning to everyone. I'm truly humbled and honored to be here this morning. And I have to give honor to God, our, our Father, to Christ Jesus, our Redeemer, and to the Holy Spirit, our Sustainer. You know, everywhere I go, I always uh, wonder, you know, what am I doing? Who am I? Because I'm really a nobody. Uh, but I'm blessed with a somebody, and uh, God has given me a fantastic wife. So my wife, she's over there, a little lady. <laughs> my wife has always been my supporter and my helper. And in, in, in the book of Proverbs, in the 18th chapter, 22nd second verse, it says, He who finds a wife, finds a good thing, it doesn't really say good like that, it says good thing, and obtains favor from the Lord. And I can tell you, I, I truly have found favor because of my wife. I also wanted to wish a happy birthday to, to Father Foster. Today is his birthday, and for those of you who don't know, Father Foster is 244 years old. <laughs> he looks fantastic for a man that's 244 years old. I have to say that. Um, uh, today is the Marine Corps birthday. 244 years ago today, the Thomas Tavern, Pennsylvania, the United States Marine Corps was born. So I'm going to ask any Marine that's, uh, that, that's visiting with us, if you just please stand for a second, if you would. And, and, and tomorrow, thank you for your service. Thank you so much. It, it's also my birthday. you and, and, um, and how you feel about it, but uh, anytime someone's shot or hurt in our city, I hurt. It hurts me, personally. When does it stop? Because I'm tired. So, uh, you have to understand, uh, when someone dies, I die. When death comes to, comes to your house, it's not funny. When death comes and visits you, it's not a good day. As I talked about that, and I started to think, and I remember the phone call that I received from one of, one of our community partners, and, and, and he said to me, you know, Chief, at the end of Halifax Street is a large, a large Confederate flag. Well, I quickly corrected him and told him it was a battle flag, not a Confederate flag. But I started to think, and I really don't care about that flag. Because the people that are dying in our streets look like me and look like you. And the people that are killing those people look like you and look like me. So I can care less about a Confederate flag, uh, a hate group, or, or any of those type of things. None of those things bother me right now. What bothers me is that people in our, in our city, in our community, that look like you and I. And I'm, I'm not a racial guy, I'm just a real guy. They look like you and I are dying. And I weep for them. And I weep for people because I understand that it's not because of poverty. That's a, poverty is a cop out. It's because of pain and because of trauma that people do things that they do. We don't want to acknowledge that, but it, it, pain and trauma are two of the, of the greatest killers in any community. But I'm talking about here in the city of Petersburg. You see, I didn't come here. Um, I didn't come here to take the police chief job because I wanted to get rich. <laughs> and, 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 and as a matter of fact, I, I teach a class at the FBI Academy. Uh, one of the classes that I, that I teach there is I teach a, a class for prospective police chiefs. And I talk to them and I, I give them this, 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 this tidbit of information amongst other things that I speak to them about. And I talk to them, never take a job if you need a job. 
Never take one if you need one because, because people can control you and you can't do the work that you're supposed to do. So it was a lot of help that, that, that brought me here. Uh, Father Foster was a big part of it. When, I, when, I, when, when Vivian and I came in to chat with Father Foster about uh, me uh, coming to the city of Petersburg, he said, I want you to meet a man. He said, he's not a regular guy now. He said, he, he, he said I want you to meet a man. He's not regular, but he makes generals. He's never been a general before, but he makes generals. That's kind of odd. Okay, I got a guy that, he's a man. He makes generals, but he's never been a general. And then he introduced me to my friend, uh, a man who, who's really helped me a lot. Now, some of y'all call him Portia. Some of y'all call him PT. But I call him Colonel. But <laughs> so he's a man. And Colonel Taylor has been a big inspiration in my life, and he has helped me since I've been here. I met another man, a man who was honest, a man who stood tall. And he really is tall, but he stood tall to me. And that's our mayor, Mayor Parham. Mayor Parham sat me down and spoke with me and told me how to keep my head up, keep my, and keep my chin tight, and, and not worry about that. And he really helped me and, 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 and had done so since I've been here. So I had it made in Virginia Beach. I forgot to tell you all that. I had helicopters, boats, jet skis, um, uh, you name it, I had it there. So why did I come to Petersburg? We had one drone when I got here, and that wasn't flying. We got four now. In Isaiah, the, the, the sixth chapter, the eighth verse, he says, Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom, whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, here am I, send me. Send me. In Paul's letter, uh, his first letter to the people in Corinth, he says, when I was a child, in the 13th chapter, the 11th verse, he said, when I was a child, I spoke like a child. I felt like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up my childish ways. So who do you have standing before you? <coughs> Folks, I put on a good facade, and I'm really nobody. My mother was a high school dropout. My father was from Jamaica. He came to this country. My father drank beer and wine. Forgive me, he didn't drink wine. That's, that's not true. My father drank rum. A lot of it. My mother gave birth to nine kids. Eight of us lived. I lived in, in, Patterson. I lived in Patterson, New Jersey. Uh, and, and, and some would call that, uh, I lived down the hill. I forgot to tell y'all that. I lived down the hill. I lived around the corner from the main. Some would call that the hood. So I'm still trying to find a city, maybe Detroit, which is more impoverished, and I would say worse with its violence. Uh, I saw Cliff shoot Hattie in the head when I was about 12. They were they lived two doors down from us. She was on the porch, she heard her holler. I can hear her holler right now. Cliff, 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 no, no, no. And I heard three shots, and he shot her in the head. I saw Son Morgan slice open slabs, uh, chest for a straight razor under the street lights. Under the street lights, I could see Son slicing up a slab over a lady named Mamie. Uh, Baby Cook was one of the guys in the neighborhood. He'd shoot bow and arrows out of the window at us. And he taught me how to, how to obtain the high ground, which taught me when I became a Marine, learning how to fight from my high and to take over the, the low points. I started shooting pool when I was about. I don't know, 13, 14 years old at Miami Gonzalez Pool Hall. That's how I used to make money. My sister, my older sister, she used to shoot dice. And my father used to send me around the corner to the, to the main with a list of numbers. The number, to, to all, all y'all know the Christian folk, you don't know about the numbers, but she used to have to go, my father used to make me play the numbers. And that's, that's the lottery, y'all. But it wasn't really the lottery back then, it was the number man. And another man, some of y'all get a good memory now. <laughs> in the house of the Lord, you remember, we ain't playing numbers no more. <laughs> but he would send me around the corner, and the number man used to yell and holler and scream at me because I couldn't remember the numbers. I couldn't remember. And, you know, he'd give me like 10 numbers to play. I couldn't remember those. They were good. But I had to go, and, and, and my father gave me numbers. Uh, and, and my mother, she gave me numbers too. My mother, I told you, she was a high school dropout. She gave me number 633. I always gave it to me. 
So in my neighborhood, I witnessed poor policing. And then on May 3rd, 1963, before all this stuff happened, I was five years old on May 3rd, 1963, and I saw in Birmingham, that's why I go to Birmingham so much to help them, because I saw on television in Birmingham how police dogs were fighting young black people for nothing. Just for, they wanted to not drink out of a different water fountain. Or they were fighting young white people too who were marching beside those young black people who didn't want to drink out of a certain water fountain. And I saw my mother cry. I said, Mom, you know, I a big man, I'm going to be in charge of a dog. And I am now. That's why I'm so against dogs fighting people because I saw it. And that trauma I lived with too, that's trauma. I told you before, trauma. Trauma causes pain. And hurt people hurt people. So the trauma that I saw affected and impacted me. Fortunately, it impacted me in a positive way. So I learned about culture. And after uh, prayerfully, and my wife and I, she'll tell you, uh, when I was offered the job, I said, nah, my gosh, I'm leaving Virginia Beach, coming to Petersburg. And I went over to Colonial Heights in the hotel we were staying in, and I went to the hotel and I literally cried. In the, in the hotel lobby, my wife held my hands and told me I was going to be okay. And we prayed, and I asked God for four things. And then the, the city manager then was a man by the name of Houston, Tom Terrell. And before I could ask him for those four things, he gave me those four things. And I came out of the, at the bar meeting, singing to my wife, and I can't sing a lick. And I said to her, he's not on God. So the things that I asked for and that I needed for to be successful, God had already given me. So when I came to Petersburg, I saw some things. I saw apathy. Nobody cares, but I do. Last year we had 17 people killed in our city. This year we have 16. Last year we took 283 illegal firearms off the street. This year we've taken, as of last, as of this Friday, we've taken 259. <coughs> right there, 259. Now I'm going to give you something. We have less than 40,000 people in our city. The city of Minneapolis, Minnesota, has about 450,000 people. Last year, they took 600 guns off the street illegally. We took almost half of what they did, and the city is 10 times bigger than us, and nobody cares. But I do. And I give you my word, every time I get them, when the judge gives me the authority, I'm going to cut them up. See, in Colonial Heights, they sell them back to the gun dealers. That's silly. You former Marines and soldiers know when you, you don't take ground twice. It costs you lives when you do that. I brought in the federal government to help us out. So when you saw the, the U.S. Attorney's Office here, they're here for keeps. When you saw the U.S. Uh, the ATF and the FBI in this city, they're here for keeps. I'm not letting them go. They can do things that I can't do. We have a revolving door in our community. People go to jail and they get back out. And nobody cares what I do. And I get mad about it. I'm really incensed by it. Because our people are helping. Just like, I digress for a second, but I have to get this out to you too. With our, with our new government in our state, there's going to be a big push for legalizing <coughs> marijuana. Okay. I'm an adjunct professor at Virginia State University, and I can tell you this. I care about my students, and I tell them, if you smoke marijuana, you're not going to get a job. So if we legalize it, you know what impacts? People that look like you and I. But oh, we're going to, no, we're going to, no. We can't allow our kids to be in with that type of foolishness. And I'm tired of it. But who cares? I do. I do. There's a lot of work to do. Uh, I'll say this to you. Uh, Deputy Chief Christian and I learned uh, about two weeks ago uh, from Dr. Hart that crime and violence is a disease, a very contagious disease. Probably one of the most contagious in our jurisdiction. And the effects of trauma are real. When all a person knows is violence and trauma, that's how they conduct themselves and that's how they behave. I said to Father Foster on a number of occasions that it's not about poverty, it's hurting people, hurt people. Pain causes you to hurt someone. Not because you really want to, but because you're in pain. And I tell you what, I've been doing this for October 2nd, so my 40th year in policing. I've been arresting folks for 40 years. We're going to arrest people for the next 40 years. Arrest isn't the answer. It's got to be other inventions, other uh, 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 innovation, other ways of doing things besides putting handcuffs on people and putting people in prison because they have to come back out. I have a nephew who's got out of prison who spent 23 years in prison for robbing a store. And today he's finding himself 
and recognizing that, ooh, that wasn't the way. But 20, it took him 23 years to realize that. Come on, there's got to be a better way. So what we did in the police department, we partnered with Virginia State. Virginia State has got some tremendous resources. And I think that, that it's an untapped uh, avenue for us in this city. They, they want to help. They want to help. I partnered with Dr. Martin in the schools, and we, we have a partnership. We, we contact each other at least three or four times a week, kind of brainstorming what we can do and what we can do better. I was asked by Buck to, 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 to give him an example of or, or what can we do, he asked me. What can we do? We have three things. Show care, love, and respect. You know, Coach is here, and, uh, and I'll tell you something. You've done a tremendous job. I really appreciate it. And Coach, if you don't know Coach, Coach stand for a second. I mean, he's also a very honest man, and he'll make you, he'll make you honest. He told me one time uh, that the kids were not having food to eat. And I said to him, I never told him this, but I'm going to tell you now from the church, you can't lie to me. He said to me, I said to him, I said, Coach, I'm going I'm to bring you a check on Monday. And he said, thank you so much. And the voice, I don't know about y'all, but the voice drives me. There's a voice. It's not no little voice in my head. It's the, it's the voice of God that drives me. The voice said to me, how dare you? How dare you wait until Monday? You have a checkbook in your car right now. The voice said to me, I may not let you live until Monday. I got so scared. <laughs> and, uh, coach, you don't know, but I was walking outside, I was crying. I was so scared. I ran and got to get that check that day, didn't I? I sure did. I wasn't going to play with the Lord. He told me, I won't let, let you live until Monday. How dare you? I've given you so I give you a city. And look at you. He told me about being pious. About being somebody who thinks he's, he's better than that. And I'm not. So when I say nobody cares, it reminds me of a Two things. In the book of Leviticus, the 13th chapter, the 45th verse, and the leper in whom the plague is, his clothes shall be rent, and his head bare. He shall put a covering upon his lips. He shall cry, unclean, unclean. I see a lot of that cry in the city of Petersburg, where we have those that sit on high and those that are low. And when we see the ones that are low, we say, they have to yell to us, unclean, unclean. Well, I'm unclean. I'm unclean. I'm going to try my best, in my best imitation of a very prominent Lutheran minister. He's a German uh, man, uh, Martin Neinmüller. Is that good? Okay. First they came for the socialists, and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out I was not a Jew. Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. That's our city. We have those on high and those who can't do, and our kids are the ones that can't do, and we sit on high, and our kids, who's speaking for our kids? I tell you what, it's not going to be funny when no one speaks for you. Oh, you know, I, I talked about the things that happened to me as a child, the trauma that I had. That, that was real. I ain't going to lie to you. That, that was real. Uh, uh, my mother was a high school dropout. She came back after she had eight kids, and she went back to high school, got a GED. She got a college degree. She wrote three books. Tired of a school teacher. My daddy used to drink beer and rum all the time. Stopped doing that. Stopped smoking cigarettes. Went out to be the first uh, captain of his of, of, at a campus police department where nobody thought they would ever do anything. My sister used to shoot dice. She just retired for the second time. She had retired as the, as the director of the Episcopal Church in um, Washington, D.C., Church of the Atonement. Jocelyn Irving is my sister. Um, she, her first profession was she was a speech pathologist. So I stuttered so much, she taught me how not to stutter so much. And that number my mother gave me, uh, number 633, had a name to it. A name was Matthew 633. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. My mother gave me that when I was a little boy. Every time we would, one of us would graduate high school or graduate elementary school, she would write that in our yearbook. And it would embarrass me. And she wrote this Christian stuff in there. But I tell you right now, it was one of the most powerful things I, I, I take with me every single day of my life. God's kingdom. My father was a drinker. He told me how to stay out of trouble. 
Come, remember Proverbs 13, 20. Walk with the wise and become wise. Associate with a fool and you'll get into trouble. I've learned to, 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 to conduct myself in a, in a new fashion now. When things go right, I look to the sky towards heaven. Or if I'm in my office, I look out the window. When things go wrong, I look at the mirror because the guy in the mirror is the one that's caused the problems or I have the answer. My father taught me a bunch of things, many things. How to build relationships, how to strive for results and success, how to inspire, how to be motivated, how to, how to really uh, uh, search for things that are powerful and to be uh, prolific when you, when you look for things. Being innovative. My father taught me that the, to be a right-handed man, not about how to, how to write, but he said to me, he says, son, uh, uh, on your left hand is your, your reputation, what things say about, people say about you, and it's going to hurt you sometimes, not going to be that good. He said, but son, in your right hand is your character, your integrity. That's the hand you place over your heart. That's the hand you should worry about, being a right-handed guy, you know, because no one can take your character or your integrity away. I say to fathers, I say fathers to this, fathers care about your son. Father, speak to your sons. And lastly, fathers love your sons. May God's grace be with all of you. Thank you.